Uh, Aloha mai kako, everyone. Welcome to Not Another White Man's Podcast, where we talk about the intersectionality of race, gender, and religion. Today, we're going to be discussing the permeation of race in higher education, you know, talking about issues like affirmative action and integration, a possibility of separate but equal in higher education, and um, a little bit more of the controversial topic. So before we begin, let's go around the room and introduce ourselves. Brandy? Hi, everybody. My name is Brandy Blocker Anderson. I am a lawyer, teacher, activist, DEI consultant, and the CEO and founder of the Anti-Racism Academy. Kendra? Hi, everyone. My name is Kendra. I'm coming to you from a Brooklyn coffee shop. Um, and I'm an entertainer based in Massachusetts, but right now I'm obviously in Brooklyn with a beautiful skylight. It's a great coffee shop. Hi, all. I'm Hala. I am a community and business development director in my town, and I'm an attorney. I'm so glad to be here speaking about the topic of higher education. And my name is Shauna. I'm based out of Honolulu, Hawaii. I am the resident sociologist here and bringing you the Hawaiian and native perspective. So on today's episode, we're going to, as Shauna said, we're going to be talking about issues of race, race in higher education and maybe some, some class as well, if we have time. Um, so in the last couple of years, there have been um, a few court, so a, a few Supreme Court cases and much controversy over the issue of affirmative action. So just for context, uh, folks, affirmative action originally started off as a federal governmental policy that was passed by um, as, through an executive order by uh, President John F. Kennedy in 1961. Uh, it was meant to apply to uh, federal um, federal employment. And so the language was something to the effect of uh, federal employers had to take affirmative action to ensure um, that employees were able to, to work um, and enjoy their employment without regard for their race. And then, of course, this is extended to uh, gender as well. Once we got finally got the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964, um, and later uh, this idea was spread to universities um, in thinking about how to go beyond the Brown versus Board of Education decision, which ended uh, separate but equal by law, um, which is a policy that, um, by and large, kept school segregated by race. So um, for the most part, African-Americans were not able to go to um, predominantly white institutions. Um, and so that had persisted for a long time. There were um, many um, instances of uh, civil disobedience and, and formal integration efforts. So you have folks like uh, James Meredith, who I want to say he integrated the University of Mississippi um, Ole Miss back in, let's see, I don't want to, don't get me to lie. Oh, look at me. Memories on a bean. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. So yes, he integrated the University of Mississippi in 1962. Um, and if you see images of him in, in his classrooms, like he was literally the only student, black student on campus. And it got to the point where like the national guard, like the, like the military had to come in to protect him because white students and like, white people were just like not having it in similar scenes with the Little Rock Nine, although it was in the K-12 context. So anyway, fast forward, um, after the 1954 Brown decision, um, you have universities start to think about, okay, how do we actually make um, this a reality? So going from having completely segregated schools to then integrating schools. And so you started to see some movement. I know at our alma mater, uh, Yale, um, back in, I want to say 1968, um, Yale admitted a group of, of Black male students. I think there were 12 of them at the time. And so that was their big effort. But obviously, 12 out of, you know, all of the thousands of students who were there at the time was not a very big dent. So um, later on, you have schools start to think about how they can kind of get around some of these uh, barriers of white supremacy. So things like aptitude tests, the SAT, for example, GPAs, um, tracking systems in K-12 schools that would systemically and routinely track 
black students lower. Um, it's all being barriers. And then just students like not even applying to those schools because they have been so like historically exclusionary. So then you see schools start to put effort into actually actively recruiting um, students of color. So for folks who've read Michelle Obama's memoir, Becoming, um, she's like a student who benefited from one of these programs of actively being like recruited to, to attend Princeton. Um, but fast forward to the, um, the, the 1990s, late 90s, you had, uh, you start seeing these, the rise of this backlash against the idea of affirmative action. And it started before then, but you had two very big Supreme Court cases that came up um, at the University of, of Michigan, one in the, in the undergraduate program and one at the law school. So University of Michigan, they essentially have been a, applying like a quota system um, for the number of like um, black students or, or students of color who were being admitted. And they also had a number of other things going on where they would put bonuses and multipliers, but essentially finding some way to um, weight the applicants so that race was taken into consideration. And so just for to clarify for folks, affirmative action doesn't mean that um, folks who cannot, you know, folks who otherwise would not be able to sustain and actually excel and, you know, do well at the university are, are, are let in. Like, no, that's not what happens. People, universities is not in their interest to let students in who are going to fail. It What it means, though, is that instead of letting in, you know, a, a whole class of white students and only looking at certain measures that don't take other factors into consideration, like you know, country of origin or socioeconomic background, or even like what opportunities you have, because research tells us that scores like um, you know what you get on your things like what you get on your SAT score or GPA, so much of that is impacted by class more than actual intelligence. So if you have money to you know te uh, practice for these things, and you tend to do better um, than people who are coming from schools and situations where um, they don't have those opportunities. So, um, so anyway, you have these uh, this conservative man, and I want to find his name because it's literally like one guy who has been bankrolling these cases that have been um, in, meant to be attacks on affirmative action. What? So yeah. So the belief is that affirmative Who's action. Find his name. <laughs> Um, let's see. That's well, so annoying because, like, it's so annoying that there's one guy bankrolling all these lawsuits instead of like feeding hungry children or something. Like, why can't you do something so, useful? Talking about Yale and affirmative action, just to throw this in here. So, in 1971, Clarence Thomas, if nobody knows who he is, he's a Supreme Court justice, entered Yale Law School. He was one of 12 black students and was a beneficiary of affirmative action program, Yale decreed that 10% of incoming class would be students of color. Um, and then maybe later we can talk about his stances on affirmative action. <laughs> yeah, he's a total hypocrite. Um, but anyway, in the, it's, in it's, it's, in, anyway, in, in both cases, um, the, the, the court, for the most part, sided with the university in, in upholding their programs. However, they did um, outlaw the use of, of quota systems in affirmative action programs. But otherwise, the Supreme Court basically said, like, you can use race as a factor, as like a plus, but that can't be like the basis. You can't just let someone in because they are of a certain race, which wasn't happening anyway, but like that was the whole concern. And so you have all these like weird cases around this idea of like reverse racism, which isn't a thing by the way, um, but that's a different topic. And fast forward to 2015, I want to say 2014, 2015, you had the case of um, Fisher versus, or University of Texas versus Fisher. Um, I think it's the name of the case where you had Becky with a bad grade. So the University of Texas had a, pro, or Texas, like had a, a, a system in place that like if for, for high school students who graduated with a certain GPA, they were like automatically like put to the top of the list of going to one of the state schools. And so like this girl like did not 
even like have those qualifications. <laughs> That's the part that gets me about it. It's like, but you didn't qualify anyway. But so, so she sued the university and this, this guy, this one guy who's bankrolling all these cases, um, who like helped her uh, sue the university and it went all the way up to the Supreme court. And thankfully she lost. Um, and you know, her claim was that the, the university of Texas by not admitting her, they were discriminating against her on the basis of race because, you know, they had let in unqualified, you know, black people to take, um, you know, her place. Even though she didn't qualify, like she, whatever. <laughs> um, and then, Oh, that's crazy. Up, I think it was like 2016, 2017, we started seeing these cases at Yale and Harvard where this is specifically um, with regarding Asian American students. And so um, unlike, and this is something that we talked about a little bit before when we talked about the gender wage gap issue, this is one area where intersectionality isn't really important to, pe to parse out differences in people of color. So in higher ed, specifically in, in universities like Yale and Harvard, Asian Americans specifically, you know, in th especially thinking about international students are um, overrepresented in terms of their overall population. So some schools have moved to say, okay, like we are going to like limit, you know, the number. And I don't think there's like a cap or anything like that, but like, you know, if, and, and I think this has come up in in the K-12 system as well in like schools like Stuyvesant in New York, whereas those school, like the school at school at one point was like majority Jewish and now is majority Asian and, but it's all a merit-based uh, process in order to get into the school. So it's a question of, like, well, should we, should we let in all these Asian students, even though like they, they are, you know, they do well to, you know, they, they pass, they, they get the scores and everything to get into the schools. So this is a sort of similar conversation happening around schools like Yale and Harvard, like, oh, why should, you know, Asian American student, uh, their, why should their applicant pool or their, um, their pool of, of folks getting admitted be limited to let in all these like less qualified black and brown people, essentially. You know, it's so that, that was kind of, the, well, that's the argument though. Right. That's always the argument underlying this. And so as someone, and this is the last thing I'll say before I shut up, <laughs> someone has gone to three of these, like, you know, like, elite schools whatever whatever i think it's just the the racism is so like deep and like thick just like in the implication of it all like i know even to this day like people still like think less of me and it doesn't matter like regardless of going to these schools where they think oh you just got in because you are black or or, or whatever and it just blows my mind <laughs> because it's like really i mean like okay i'll give you one but three <laughs> like but anyway so i want to add another okay clarence thomas going back to clarence thomas um so his stances on affirmative action are kind of leaning in another direction besides reverse racism he this is from the new yorker everyone um for him affirmative action is the most recent attempt by white people to brand and belittle black people as inferior affirmative action does not formally mirror the tools of white supremacy for thomas it is the literal continuation of white supremacy he would say that <laughs> so wait, let's understand that. So he's saying the fact that you have affirmative action, that in and of itself is a form of racism because you're saying that uh, people are not capable of getting in on their own merits. Therefore, it's a racist policy to begin with. Is that what he's trying to say? He I'm said his to... argument is rooted in two beliefs, each formed by his time spent on the left. First is the affirmative action reinforces the stigma that shadows African-Americans among many whites Blackness signals a deficit of intellect, talent, and skill. Even Supreme Court Justices Thomas wrote, in one opinion, assume that anything that is predominantly Black must be inferior. Says when the state and social institutions identify uh, African Americans as being in need of help, they reinforce that stigma. Uh, it doesn't matter if a, um, African Americans succeed without affirmative action. And then he said, in the same way that enslavement marked all black people free, free or slave as inferior in formative act, a formative action here, Thomas borrows directly from the language of Plessy versus Ferguson, Plessy. stamps all Plessy versus Ferguson, stamps all African American, 
African Americans with a badge of inferiority. So it's interesting what you said, Brandy. I don't think, like my understanding is the affirmative action policies really were a response to racism that existed in society. So the idea was, we're going to put this into place so we can um, end the racism that racist policies that are there that don't allow admission. And also, hopefully, we can help reverse some of the negative that has happened. Exactly. So now it's interesting that um, maybe at first that seemed okay to people. But as the years have gone on, what's going on that people are like, looking at it as like in the way that Clarence Thomas just said. Clarence Thomas. <laughs> yeah, I feel like it's like kind of a response. I mean, I guess it's like kind of aligned to like Trump and stuff, right? Like it's like white people being afraid that they're somehow losing power because there's like three black kids and they're graduating class. Um, yeah, I feel like this this entire discussion is really interesting because like we have so much material that shows like economic class is the biggest predictor of like SAT scores or whatever. We know that economic class is like tied very much to race in this country, but people are still kind of like doing these weird loop loop arguments to be like, actually, if you like get in on affirmative action, that means like, like they think of you as less than. Whereas like, for, like at, for Yale, I think the average SAT score for like black people is still really high. It might be like, yeah. uh, it might be like a hundred or like 50 points less than like average white person, but it's still high. It's not, it's not like they let in like, black kids who have like no. 10 100 on the SATs like it's not you know um so that that's like one thing that I also think about a lot when it comes to these discussions this is what I imagine when I talk about when I think about SAT is like I was too poor to afford SAT classes like I know a lot of people like go to these courses that teach them how to take the SAT or they buy books that teach them how to take the SAT because it's all, if you ever take your standardized tests for higher education, it's all like strategy of how to answer questions. It's not necessarily about your intellect, your capability. So if you haven't taken a course or read a book, you're automatically not going to get a like perfect score. It's not possible. Um, And so when you can afford those things, your score is going to be probably higher. I feel like if I could afford a class if I could have afforded a class or afforded a book, I would have probably gotten a perfect score. But like, I didn't have those things because I was too poor. So I think the audience should look back and think, oh, did I get, could I afford to take an SAT class? Or could I afford to buy an SAT book? Because if you can't, you're already disadvantaged. Yeah, well, no, and- that's definitely true. Oh, sorry. Um, oh, no, you're- I was gonna, I um. So I used to teach SAT courses, like back uh, back in the day, I was SAT tutor. And the way I practice for the SAT is like, I got the book. So I was like kind of the um, income level or my family was the income level where we could afford like the books, but they didn't get me classes. And I would just like take the tests over and over again. And like, literally that's the secret to any of these standardized tests, just like take them over and over again, even if you're like, like, I guess there's, like, a little bit of some level where it's, like, oh, like, if you can't figure this out, it might be, like, harder for you. But it's, like, it's a t- it doesn't measure how smart you are. It just measures how good you are at taking this test. And that's, like, what we tell students in these expensive-ass SAT or ACT courses. Just, like, take it over and over again, and you'll get better at it. Um, right. Yes. Um, but, yeah, I – oh, go ahead. I was going to say, but even then there's a time tax, like for kids who have to work yes, jobs and take care of kids yeah. and do things. It's like on the scale. Well, exactly. If you also have, like, for example, I'm going back to experience, right? Like I was in foster care. So nobody told me that you need to practice tests. Plus you have to pay for each test you practice with. So yeah. it is. Yeah, a book. you could. But if you buy a book yeah, of yeah. tests, then, but like there are programs where. Is. No, I mean, I know for the it's for the LSAT, pricey. like you have to pay, like, and you definitely should invest in a course if you're going to take the LSAT. Like, it's just like an, a wise investment for someone going to that. But those courses are like twelve hundred dollars, like at, at minimum. And then, I mean, like the exam. I think the, the average score for Black women is like a one forty two out of one eighty. 
And I know for most of black folks I know who have gone to like top law schools, like their score, the score, the necessary score to get in to those programs is more like a 160, which is still like heads and tails over the median, which is 150 and like far above what is expected, which is a 143. So it's like, you know, if those people had the all the resources, could they get to 180? Probably. Yeah. But like, does yeah. that mean they, yeah, you know, are they less, you know, I don't know. Like, I don't, I think all those tests are racist anyway. So who wrote the it, tests? Like, that's the question, like right? Who wrote dudes. the tests? What do we, like, it's a male white, right? So um, what are the strengths of a woman? What are the strengths of people? Like, there's different strengths in intellect, right? Like, there's two different types of intellect. There's emotion. I, I feel, yeah. I mean, yeah, I like and I believe. I um yeah I also don't like it I think it's like stupid I I might be wrong about this but I like I've heard the SAT was literally created so that colleges or maybe it might have been like uh, admissions essays like the essay you have to write for college but some of these things were literally created so that colleges would have an excuse to not admit as many Jewish people like it's it makes no sense like it's it's unnecessary it doesn't predict how well you did in college like i did pretty okay on my sat i did not do well in college because it was my first time on my on my own own and i had like undiagnosed add um tip for like parents out there though for a lot of these tests nowadays uh for a lot of these tests nowadays you could find you could download tests online um or like find pdfs of the test online to give your kids um, so that they could practice. You don't need to like buy a book nowadays, unless like they're getting better at scrubbing the text away. But I don't know if that's true. So yeah. you guys, okay, it sounds like you guys are not that into the SAT. So you'll be happy to hear this, that I, I have kids applying to colleges now. And a lot of colleges post COVID have now said that they're not that you do not have to submit an SAT score. And you don't and they're not going to take it into consideration. Because last year, a lot of people couldn't take the SAT because testing sites were shut down. And people didn't have access to studying for them, etc. So there have been a lot of colleges and there's been a movement for many years now against these types of standardized tests. Um, so there are a lot of colleges now yeah. saying they're not that into it. Now, I think there's like pros and cons for it, but bringing it back to affirmative action, my question is like, do we, is there like, are you guys saying that affirmative action, it's like not so much about race, people who have difficulty in higher education, it's more about affordability and where you are? No, it's not that, it's both. So one, it's like schools budget. have been historically exclusionary. They just have not let in students of color. And a lot of that goes, a lot of, you know, conceptions about, you know, what is intelligence, like what schools are good schools to recruit from, where do we? So I, I worked for the Yale Admissions Office, uh, both when I was there as a student and I, I still conduct alumni interviews. But when I was a student, I took... Uh, took, I, I participated in a program called the Student Ambassadors Program, which was intended for like folks who, in my position, folks from like um, target schools, which had students with like high achieving students in like underserved schools. There was some like weird language they used to describe it, but basically they would send us over breaks to like go to schools in our our in our areas to recruit or like at least get to drum up interest. And a part of this is because like, you know, schools like Yale never would recruit, like never even like send anybody, never actively try to recruit anybody ever. So this is like their way of making in And they weren't going to send like an actual like, you know, admissions officer. But they also like, you know, <laughs> here, take this like freshman, like, you know, they'll come and talk to you, whatever. And that, I, you know, I, I wonder like, I'm sure that program had various levels of success. But one of the things that I heard from the admissions officer was that in like 2006 or something, like in all 50 states, they couldn't find a hundred black student, black male students to apply to Yale to not even just like apply. And I'm like, and what? that used to, yeah. No. Yeah. Right. And that used to, I used to like buy into that like back then. Cause you know, I was like a chosen one. One I was like, you know what I mean? I was one who got picked. So, like, wow, there must not be very many people like me who can like are good enough to go to school. Like, yeah. But then as I got older and especially like after becoming a teacher and like seeing so much of how like this whole thing works. And then like you see things like Aunt Becky and like, you know, the, and which I always knew when I was there, like I always knew that everybody there 
student athlete recruits. It's like y'all are not all like, and y'all looking at me like I'm not qualified. Like self-imposed though. Like how much of that is like people thinking that you know there were only 50 male or 100 male, or whatever black people who apply because they, they think themselves, oh, this is something I could apply to, or this is something that will take me. So not that well, that's there a part of it. Qualified people out yeah, there, but that's a huge part putting, of it. Yes, they exactly. Leaning in and like taking the opportunity. Well, there, so that's that's where they play the. That's where like the blame is placed on you know the individuals for you know oh of course like people from these schools are not applying to schools that have historically been extremely elite, right? So when you hear the word like oh only six percent of applicants get admitted. Most people aren't applying, A, and then B, when you know the school costs so much money, like, you know, and then like, C, when you know, even if you are a genius, and we have so many students who are just brilliant, they're just like naturally gifted, but like they just are in schools that cannot serve their needs, though I witnessed firsthand like the gatekeepers, like as far as like guidance counselors and folks, like I was like, literally like, I'm here from Yale, Yale sent me here to come and recruit students from your school. And the guidance counselors would be like, no, that's okay. <laughs> we don't want you to come. Like, Damn. all of our, straight up, like, all of our students why, are done applying you, to college. Wow. And I'm like, it's November. How are they all done? Like, I don't. I, um, yeah, that's because they're Because they're racist. That's why. Talking about uh, recruitment. The counselors themselves just don't know. Like, I, I'm in, like, my kids go to a, a decent school system. And, you know, the guidance counselor does herself didn't go to an I exactly so they school. can't possibly see they can't imagine someone exactly else that like I've definitely I, seen that going yeah. back to my own experience with recruiting so this is what happened so when I was applying for college um I thought I was never going to get into Yale or Harvard so I didn't even consider applying there but there was a program out of Dartmouth that were recruiting native students. And so they reached out to our school proactively and said, hey, we have a program where you can come to Dartmouth yes. and spend like a week there and then talk to counselors and kind of basically interview already mm -hmm. for Dartmouth. And so I go there and I'm sitting down and the guy who's the admissions counselor is talking to you. And he said, quite honestly, if you apply to Dartmouth, you're going to get in. But I think that if you apply to Harvard and Yale, you'll get in. So you should apply and make Yale your uh, early, to go to early decision. So I would have never even considered Yale or Harvard wow. if I hadn't gotten that class to go to, that course to go to Dartmouth for like a week. Yeah, that's how it is. That's And that's, then I was early that's decision. That's really interesting. Yeah, yeah, I was early decision at Yale. So it's all like in the programs and stuff. Go ahead, Kendra, sorry. Oh, I've, um, I've also heard on the flip side, I mean, both things that are probably true and they probably encourage a certain type of student, i.e. like white people to apply. But I've heard that Yale will encourage students to apply that they like know probably won't get in so that they could increase, they could like lower the acceptance rate and make it seem even more exclusive. Because if you like look back at history, yeah. Um, if you look back at history, like, you know, in the 1970s or 80s, Yale was still like exclusive, but the admissions rate was 20 or so percent because like not as many people were applying. But like what, I mean, like it's probably a lot of guidance counselors gassing up mediocre, or not mediocre, but like hardworking white students or like, like, you know, middle class students that may not be as great. And then like being like, oh, like this student's like a person of color, like they won't like it even if they're like completely capable. So it's probably like a mixture of all these weird things, um, like what you saw, Brandy, and what you saw, Shauna, and then and then guidance counselors like not being great and being gatekeepers and racist, and like that creates this situation. Well, I'm going to add one more reason why there is an increase in applicants having applied back in the day and having my kids apply today. Back in the day, it was very difficult to apply. Everything was handwritten. You had to get the application, do every little thing by hand, get That's everything written down. You you didn't even have a typewriter. No, the common app okay? changed the game. The common app made it ignorant. Common app made it ignorant. I'm a common app kid. Oh my God. It's like, like you know, yes, I applied to 21 schools. I applied <laughs> like, to three schools and that was a lot. You know, like you just like, the most anyone of fee waivers, to, period. You know, now yeah. it's like common to go, and eight was like ridiculous. Like, well, now you see those stories every year of like the kid who like I got to like one hundred and eight schools, and like it's 
like so I think that's like excessive, tech, but <laughs> tech might have something more to do with it because I'm not kidding you. The average school you played, you applied for your reach, the one you thought you could get into, and your safety. Like the, right. that was like essentially how it went. And maybe you did like two or three more, but yeah, didn't well, do here's the well, here's the other thing that a lot of people don't recognize is that, and this is something I know from having done interviews now on the other side as an alumni interviewer and shout out to my alumni interviewer uh who cat who actually came to my high school she came to our college fair i was able to go up to her table and talk to her and after i got in she actually called my mom and i like went to her house like and it was like a whole thing so like shout out to alumni interviewers like that's oh, that's, that's really great. um that's so but nice. anywho um one of the things I know that Yale like really looks for is, and I'm sure this is true across the board for, for any, like for any schools, especially schools that are like, you know, academically competitive, whatever, whatever is like, not just perfect SAT scores and GPAs, because like that can come a dime a dozen grades are inflated. Like they, they can't really like judge one high school program against another for the most part, unless, you know, you are coming from those like super elite schools that are known to be like feeders but otherwise, you know, they're, they're really, people are coming from all over the place, but what they really look for, um, outside of that, it's like, what kind of person you are, Like they don't want a bunch of the same person walking around. They want people who are motivated to change the world. They want people who are going to get along well with others. I think they probably, you know, just like obligatorily or like are obligated to let in a certain like percentage of like people just because they have to but those other people they want to make sure they're creating a community of like you know liberal-minded people who like like diversity and like you know i mean a lot of the kids who i interview like they've started organizations they like every summer they've done like something or even if they had to work you know instead of being able to do something that obviously people who don't have to work are able to do like they put so much meaning into everything that they do. It's not just like checking boxes and going, even if it is like, they're super impressive. Like it's crazy. I'm like, I don't know how they got in now. I have I, a theory. I have a theory with Yale and letting in. Okay. My theory is that charisma plays a part. And some of the folks that probably aren't going to go into sciences, whatever, but like charisma plays a part because I think Yale picks kids that they think are going to make Yale famous. Like if the person themselves becomes famous, then Yale's attached to the name, right? And so if you're go if you're not somebody he's gonna be like discovering the next like Nobel Prize in science or whatever, um, and you're gonna do liberal arts. But so that's my theory with Yale is they want famous people. Or how much of it is to benefit the white power structure and how much of it is to benefit the individual beneficiaries. And when I think about like, you know, what uh, like what integration has meant for black communities and black institutions. There have been many positives. Like a lot of black people have been able to, you know, ascend to levels like Supreme Court justice, thanks to affirmative action. Clarence um, Thomas. Uh, but like at the same time, like, you know, we have now communities where like there's just such concentrated poverty because all the black intellectuals have left. All, they have all like gone and like gone into these white spaces. They don't come and teach in black schools. They go and teach in white schools you know, like the Cornell West of the world and like they, they at Princeton, like if you, if you want to, you know, get that information, you have to be in elite spaces and they're not in the communities. Um, so, so my, one of my professors at Yale, Elijah Anderson, who's a probably a prime example of this, he talks about this as the proliferation of tokens that like once affirmative action policy started, once integration really kicked up and blacks were able to move into white neighborhoods and go to white schools that it essentially left like black communities, um, you know, like in, in situations of concentrated poverty without role models, without, you know, just diversity of economic status within the community whereas before like with like black wall street before it got bombed obviously or like harlem or there's been other like black enclaves where you had like black doctors and teachers and all of these things you know you stop having that because black people were able then to go and like live amongst white people and go teach okay. white schools so here's a non-race spin on the same uh, ultimate effect that you're talking about um, I once listened to a talk about 
uh, its development and the history of like cities and towns, right? And how once upon a time you would have cities where a very wealthy person would live next door to a very poor person and like, you know, and next door to a middle class person. And there was no uh, bifurcation of like that neighborhood economically. Like you, the person who cleans your house could be living two doors down from you, right? Um, but today that's not the case, right? Today, like there are wealthy na- neighborhoods and poor neighborhoods and like, it's all like- It was a process. By class, right? And so the question is, why did that happen? And one of the factors that they connected it to, though, was transportation and the ability for cars to come into place that you could go to different places and separate yourself out and create a bubble of so exactly it wasn't just cars though so want. cars was one of one of it but also the GI bill which which gave low interest loans to poor middle class working class white folks and enable companies like the Levitts to to, to start building Levitt towns and things like that and the the US uh, Highway um, Administration Act that you know provided for funds to build highways to you know create these little white utopias outside of cities because black people were coming in droves from the south to escape Jim Crow all of this is all connected it's I'm all so- like And so it's interesting then because then what happens, right? Like um, it kind of led to like this environment where people just want to live somewhere where everybody else is like them. So I have a question for you though, Brandy. And like just total- But now look what they're doing. They're coming back into the cities. They're they're setting up shop in these like really like- like dilapidated neighborhoods and they're buying them, they're taking them over the gentrification. Like they're not not scared. Uh, So here's my question. (laughs) Yeah, I'm in Brooklyn. I could see it. Like, it's wild. Here's my question. Like, now that that's happened, right, and you have um, very unfortunate situations in some difficult city scenarios, and I know, like, you grew up, and also, uh, Shauna, you, like, you say you grew up poor and it was very difficult. Now that, like, you're older yeah. and you have a kid, right, let's say you, you have okay. children, well, when you do, or what, you know, if you do, if you want to have it, like, you can imagine now that you'd say to yourself, oh my gosh, I lived in a very difficult environment. I want my kid to be in a different environment. What's that going to do? You're going to go to another town and not the town in which you grew up. So you're going to be one of those people who's left because you want to give a different opportunity. So what it sounds like is we are allowed to live in our neighborhood where we're at that have sculpted us as people and not have identity crises by having affirmative action where create, where, where, um, uh, what is that called? We're tearing down barriers and not making people relocate to white neighborhoods, white schools in order to qualify to, to like get into Yale. Does that make sense? No. Like we allow people to be where they're at. They don't have to af- conform and move away to kind of tear down barriers that restrict people of color. Brandy, you're on mute. Yeah, I, 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 I guess I would agree with that. I mean, because I know the program that I was talking about before, the, the Yale Ambassadors program, it was both for like kids in, in urban areas, but also for people in rural areas, which I always took to mean like poor white folks. And I know that was also like an emphasis for Yale as well to be trying to recruit more white students from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and from more rural areas um, as well, because that's something else I noticed that was not very well represented at Yale, like just people from different class backgrounds. Like I very much felt like I was like one of like the few few like poor students like even compared to my black classmates like i feel like the the vast majority of them were from at very least middle if not upper middle class like the halls of power which are predominantly white men and i i'm talking a lot about congress but i'm also talking about like even nonprofits of people who've been in power at nonprofits for a very very long time there's literally white men oil painting of george bush in our dining hall like a year like just But like the thing is, is like being the reason why they listen to you is because you say I went to Yale and it opens doors because they're like, oh, shit, she went there. It opens it because not only. And then you once they open that door, you're like, okay, thank you for opening that door. I will be your token so I can keep the door open. 
Absolutely. No, but no, or you can be like Clarence Thomas and you could say slam the door. Right. Could be Clarence Thomas. But it's also your contacts and connections that you will have for the rest of your life of people that you know. So there is there is value to that. Which is why I think of like something about affirmative action. Like it's a good thing in some way. But as I'm listening to you guys, I'm thinking and always there's some benefit to not being like in these top schools and instead having gone to a university that is all black or all female, like an all women's college yeah, or a black I wanted to go to an all, all black college. School. Yeah, I so I applied to Spelman, I applied to Smith, Vassar, like all of the like Wellesley, like I thought I was gonna actually go to Wellesley. Like that was like my like top choice. I first of all, I didn't have any idea that I could even get into a school like like Yale or like, like any of those top schools. Like I thought like going to Penn State would have been like the tops because like that was like the best that the people around that me had gone to. School, and it, the top school it is. Country. It literally is. It literally <laughs> is. But like so, in my mind, like that was like the pinnacle. And then it wasn't until like someone I you know I did a summer I did a summer program at Yale, which is how I even got. Experience exposed to that school but it was like someone had to suggest it to me that I you know like because who who even but the reason why just to close that loop from before why, re, why I brought up Harvard is the reason why I chose Yale over Harvard is because the experience I had with the black students at Yale versus at Harvard and I felt that class would have been a, a huge issue for me like I did not so one of the things they paired me with this other black girl when I went to visit Harvard and we had nothing in common other than the fact that we were black she was from like a very rich black um background and one of the first things she said to me when I was explaining to her that I was diving between Yale and Harvard she's like oh like you're you're thinking about going to Yale like it's in the middle of a ghetto <laughs> yikes yikes <laughs> like wow okay um and then like whenever she would introduce me to other students they would just be like oh well like you know what makes you like how did you get in basically <laughs> like what like damn like I just met you like can we just like kick it and then I went to their like beat their black students union like election meeting so that gave me a lot of insight into their dynamics and I just saw the divide between like the very wealthy black folk like the black folk who like you can't even like, really tell they're black folk like because <laughs> But that's a whole other thing. Um, and then the people were like do rags <laughs> on and things. <laughs> like, and they it was just like so stratified in the way they talked about the candidates. It just felt like I was not gonna be like, I'm like, I'm from the ghetto, like I don't have anybody. And they just weren't one thing that said to me the most is that the black students did not have a, a regular meeting space. Like it was a whole question, like, oh, where are we going to have this election meeting? And like, whereas I knew at Yale that there was like, a, um, like an Afro American cultural center. And then when I went in, like, I spent time at Yale, like, the black student just embraced me. Like, even though like, I still felt like a fish out of water somewhat because, like, I, you know, I'm not from an upper crusty background, first generation college student, all of that. Like, there was just like much, a much more greater sense of community and I felt like the school itself just like cared a little bit more about its students and I felt like people went there not because of the name but because maybe maybe in part because of the name but because they actually liked it as opposed to people yeah, at Harvard only if you get to decide between Yale and Harvard <laughs> I guess so yeah. come on yeah. like let's just be real here I mean like okay so we're talking about higher education I do want to mention like um I was a native person there were some native people at Yale and we had like a native American cultural house, but for some reason I did feel disconnected a lot because of class. And, um, so I used to hang out with like all the ghetto kids and that's kind of what I fit into. Uh, so, but it also was like people of color. Like, so a lot of the time it was uncomfortable to be the same with natives. Like all of them were rich, you know, like, so it was really hard for me to be, um to like identify and there were only a handful of them that have family on the reservation and so if you difference between like natives who are urban and like natives who are from reservations a lot of the times it's like it's poor so it was hard for me to like even understand them and then people from hawaii were the ones from hawaii were not hawaiian i was like the only hawaiian and so I kind of just was that loner and floated around with all the people of color. Like I was just like, yeah, you know, one that. day at like that mom house, like Shana was honorary black. <laughs> 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 
It sounds like you felt like you connected more to people based on their class, more so, and even what you're saying, Brandy, that it was the class united you more than the race or your cultural But background. somewhat. No, I had no. Yeah, a lot of my friends are rich, rich kids. Like, yeah. I, 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 I hand, it's only a few of us. Like, I can count on one hand. It's like me and Shauna met. Like, <laughs> it's be like, oh, okay. <laughs> we got, we got some things in common.